the conventional approach to type 2 diabetes is we tell patients it's chronic, it's progressive. There's really nothing you can do. We'll start you on one med, but by you know nine years, 90% will be on two meds. By 11 to 13 years, you know, many of you will be on insulin, half of you will be on insulin. And oh, by the way, if you don't maintain good blood sugar control, you, you, you might go blind, you might get your, you know, you might need an amputation, you might have a heart attack, you might have a stroke, you're at higher risk for cancer. Oh, and did we tell you that you, there's a higher risk for depression? And really what we want to try to get across to people is, is well, wait a second, the underlying process of insulin resistance is absolutely reversible, right? And so people sometimes get hung up on, you know, the word reverse, but we just mean that you're able to take it in a different direction. Welcome to Friendly Pharmacy 5, where we bring you leading experts to explore innovative approaches in health and longevity. Today, I'm delighted to have Dr. Brendan Byrne, the co-founder and chief medical officer at Lifestyle RX with us. Dr. Byrne is a pioneering physician who has created a virtual platform dedicated to type 2 diabetes reversal. Dr. Byrne brings over 25 years of medical expertise with him and a unique blend of clinical practice and entrepreneurship to the forefront. Trained at Yale and McGill, he has been a digital pioneer creating a company that built electronic medical record software for physicians that was eventually acquired by TELUS Health. As the Chief Innovation Officer for TELUS Health from 2015 to 2018, Brendan played a pivotal role in shaping the landscape of healthcare technology in Canada. Today, in his role as the co-founder and Chief Medical Officer at Lifestyle RX, Brendan utilizes his wealth of experience and expertise to apply the latest scientific insights on metabolic health to patient care. The clinical team at Lifestyle RX focuses on guiding individuals through safe and sustainable changes, empowering them to take charge of their health and reverse the progression of metabolic disease. Join us in this insightful conversation as we delve into Dr. Brendan Burns' passion for using cutting edge science to transform behaviors and optimize health. Discover the empowering approach of creating personalized wellness practices that are not only enjoyable and energizing, but also serve as a foundation for long-term health. Welcome, Dr. Brennan Byrne, to Friendly Pharmacy 5. Hey, Lindsay. It's great to be here. I'm so thrilled to be speaking with you because you've founded this incredible company that focuses on metabolic health and diabetes reversal. And we're going to really get into that. Um, but often, you know, on the, our channel, we get a lot of comments like, well, doctors don't know anything about nutrition. Pharmacists don't know anything about nutrition. That is not the case today, Dr. Byrne. You, you've, you've been in this field for quite a while. Can you tell us a little bit about your, your history and what kind of led you up to this point where you founded this, um, where you founded Lifestyle RX? Yeah, so, so by training, I'm a family physician. And um, early in my career, I had a bit of a detour. I, I started an electronic medical record company called Wolf Medical. Um, it grew to be kind of the largest hosted EMR in Canada and it was pretty successful. Um, sold that to TELUS, built their EMR group there. So I, I found myself you know, <laughs> a VP at TELUS, not kind of what I envisioned when I went to medical school. Um, ultimately, I ended up doing uh, being the chief innovation officer for health for a couple of years, which was amazing in terms of seeing kind of all the things that are, you know, all the technologies that are coming and all the breakthroughs that are coming. Um, and it really made me realize I wanted to get back into practice. Uh, I didn't really set out to kind of, you know, go to medical school to, to just do the software part of it. Um, and so what I looked at kind of was, was, you know, well, what, what is my practice going to look like? And, and I had, had the kind of the luxury of, of having some choice there. And so uh, lifestyle medicine intrigued me because, you know, our current, so if you look at what ails us in our society, it's lifestyle diseases, right? You could you could attribute 85% of the cause of death to have major lifestyle components. And yet we don't really tackle that in 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 you know kind of our, our traditional health system. Um, and so I, I kind of liken it like our current approach is we've got cars driving off a cliff and we've got an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, right? And it's kind of like you know, but we could, we need to go up to the top of the cliff and put a barrier in because this is this is an exercise of prevention. Um, and so, you know, that really got me, you know, the whole concept of lifestyle medicine and, and looking at saying, hey, what what would happen if we actually paid attention to the lifestyle behaviors, nutrition, exercise, sleep, stress, relationships, purpose, actually paid real attention to those first 
and then use medicine when we need to, right? And that's kind of the lifestyle medicine pro- approach, you know, lifestyle first, and then and then bring in medicine if you need to. What, what would happen? And um, so I built a practice that was very high touch. And it was, um, you know, so if you came into our facility, there's a plant-based cafe, there's a large gym, there's a meditation space. We had physicians, exercise physiologists, dietitians, clinical counselors, kind of this team around you. And we called it Wellness Garage because it was like you're going to come in for a tune-up, right? Um, and and so that was kind of, it was fun to, 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 to build that. I also thought I would bring in um, like, you know, molecular medicine. So genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, um, you know, and, and really kind of, you know, just a very precision approach to lifestyle medicine. What I kind of learned from doing it very quickly was, you know, I didn't really need the precision tools because, you know, a tape measure and a waist circumference often tells me most of what I need to know. Um, and, and conventional lab tests actually work pretty well for, for metabolic health, as we'll talk about. Um, and so, you know, we, we started to kind of work with people and start, and, and we started to learn a lot. And, and in fact, in fact, you know, it was kind of this combination of, you know, learning about physiology on one side um, and really kind of understanding kind of how behaviors affect physiology. And then the other side completely differently is psychology. Cause, cause obviously, you know, in lifestyle medicine, we don't get any results unless patients are able to make change and just telling people what to do doesn't really work. Right. So you have to kind of work through kind of the psychology. Um, and so we developed a, a really robust process and a really ro- robust program. And then COVID hit, right? And uh, COVID was devastating for, for our clinic. You know, so the wellness garage was, you know, a very nice facility that became a private family gym for a few months as we just couldn't see people in, in there. Um, and, uh, but within the first week of COVID, the seed for Lifestyle RX was planted. Uh, and what happened was we had a diabetes program that we were doing kind of group sessions in, in wellness garage. Um, it was, it was kind of all kind of through the publicly funded system. So it wasn't really using kind of exercise physiologists and it wasn't super high touch. It was really kind of using kind of existing, um, existing kind of insured fee codes, um, to, to help people make changes. When COVID hit, we had to go online. So we jumped on zoom, um, and, and it was kind of this, it was, the penny dropped. And, you know, I often say like, I should have, I should have known this because I, I, like I had a deep background in EMR. I saw virtual care from the very beginning. I didn't get it. Right. I thought virtual care was purely kind of, you know, synchronous one-on-one. We do, we do a, a zoom call. What's the big deal. Yeah. It's integrated into your EMR, you know, but like, it didn't seem that exciting to me to tell you the truth. Within that first week, I, I realized, wow, wait a second. If, if we go virtual like this, first of all, everybody in the province can access what we're doing. And we actually, with, within like, you know, we were doing one group and within the first kind of, you know, week of COVID, we had three groups going. And so people wanted this. So, so it increases the access to care. The second thing I realized was between kind of the groups on Zoom and then if we're, you know, if we're interacting through a computer, you know, we can do it one-on-one, we can do it with group. But we could also do it asynchronously because, you know, if you're going to log into something, you know, maybe my recorded version of what is insulin resistance is better than my live version, especially after the 20th time I've explained it in a day. Right. Um, and so it, it really got to this place where I, I kind of realized that, you know, the challenge with lifestyle medicine and the reason why most doctors don't really go down that path is not that it's not effective. It's that it takes too much time and you just don't get compensated properly for it. And so you know, uh, with, with, you know, going virtual, what you realize is between kind of, you know, one-on-one group and asynchronous, um, you can actually get to a place where you can take one hour of clinician time and turn it into about 30 to 40 hours of program time. And that makes all the difference, right? Because, you know, now you have more than enough time. Um, and, uh, and it was this real shift. Um, of course, the, the challenge was that was the idea, <laughs> uh, you know, and it was kind of clear. Um, I needed to figure out kind of how to build this because um, my technology chops were a little bit old. Um, you know, we founded Wolf back in 1997. So, uh, you know, it wasn't exactly current technology uh, at that point in time. Um, but I did find uh, my co-founders who, who uh, you know, are, yeah, at that time were 20, 20, four-year-old, a couple of 24-year-old guys that had started an EMR company when they were in high school. Um, and 
uh, and so, so we, we had connected over, you know, over a period of time on LinkedIn, uh, I'd mentored them a little bit. And, uh, so when I got this idea, it was kind of like serendipity, which, which often happens just how, ha- you know, Jason ha- happened just to reach out and, you know, said, Hey, that we're, we're selling our EMR company. Are you doing anything interesting? And I was like, Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and so, so we realized we needed to build this full stack virtual care kind of technology in order to support the program. And, and that's what we did. We launched it in, um, you know, back in 2022. Uh, and, and now we've, we've, we've been growing really quite considerably since then. So, um, and the, and the really cool part is, is that what we're seeing is that, that, you know, approach, it works and it can scale. And this is what I think is really exciting because as you know, type two diabetes is an epidemic, right? So almost 11% of the population has uh, diabetes. Most, you know, most of them are type two. Um, if you look at type two, you know, if you go back to the 1960s, it was less than 2% of the population, right? And so, you know, what's changed since there, our lifestyles have changed. And, and so it really calls for a lifestyle approach and, you know, we're not doing it kind of in, in conventional practice. So, um, so, th- so that's what we, <laughs> that's what we've been working on. That's an amazing story. Thank you so much for sharing that. I remember I first met you when you were, I think it was back in 2020 or 2021, and this was all just kind of starting out, right? Uh, but it's a, it's really inspiring because the, uh, like you said, like the the lack of accessibility for people to to access this kind of support and education um, is is uh, something that people want. It just hasn't been there, right? And I remember. Uh, in the pharmacy, uh, there was one one story that always stands out to me is, you know, a man came in, I think he was probably mid 30s. And he was getting a medic, he was getting a prescription for metformin, never had any medications before. He had just been diagnosed with type two diabetes. And the look on his face was he was just absolutely devastated. And I didn't know what had gone on at the physician's office or how things had been explained. But he he just he 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 almost looked like he'd been given some kind of death sentence and he didn't want this medication. And at the time I had to counsel him on the medication, but I did let him know, you know, you can, there's other things that you can do. um, And you you can, you know, I I don't know if I use the word reversal, right? But there are other options. But at that time, I didn't know, I didn't have a place to send him to, right? That was all I could offer. And so now you've, you've provided for these patients, another, another option. And I know that you use a lot of different modalities that we'll get into um, to address this. Um, But if, if you could kind of give us, and maybe this man at the pharmacy could have used this explanation at the time, um, could you explain to us, uh, you know, the process of type 2 diabetes. I know that insulin resistance is really kind of the the backbone of this. Can you explain to us what is insulin resistance? We've gone over this a few times on the channel, but I'm sure you'll have a, a great explanation for us as to why, what this causes in the body and how it happens. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I joke. Insulin resistance is like one of these suitcase words, right? Like yeah, a lot of stuff gets stuffed into them. And so sometimes you have to try to figure this out, but Let's even take a step back from that. If, if we look at kind of blood sugars in your body, it's, it's always a balance between how much insulin your pancreas can produce and how much resistance that insulin faces. So kind of your pancreas is beta cell capacity. That's the, the cells that produce insulin versus this insulin resistance. And that'll determine your, your, your what's happening with your, your blood sugar. So, and we usually use A1C to kind of tell us what, what a kind of an average blood sugar is. Um, and so, you know, type one diabetes, you're not making any insulin. So clearly it tips out of balance right away. Um, uh, but for most people with type two diabetes, what's happening is, um, they're getting resistance to the insulin and that's the actual primary problem. And so it's not that they can't make insulin. It's not that they can't make a lot of insulin It's they can't make enough insulin. And so basically the, the balance kind of falls out because the insulin resistance becomes so heavy, you know, they, they, they get so insulin resistant. So what is insulin resistance? Well, Probably the best way to actually frame it is insulin resistance is actually a whole bot your whole body's response to something called energy overload, right? So energy, we get it from food. If we take in more energy than we use, we're going to store that energy. So our bodies are going to be very thrifty um, and, and we're going to keep that energy. Um, initially, we're going to store that energy in our healthy zone. And so we're going to store it in kind of our, you know, gluteofemoral or kind of our hips, you know, hips, butt. 
uh, legs um, and kind of that pear shape. And, and that's a healthy fat zone, right? And, and I actually have to really emphasize people, like it's not neutral, like it's not just neutral, it's okay. It's actually metabolically healthy to, to have fat kind of in, in your legs, right? And you think, you know, when, when, when women are gaining weight in pregnancy, that's where they gain the weight, right? It's a healthy fat zone and, and your body's well designed for that. Um, so we store that extra energy. And, uh, but each of us have a different personal fat threshold, a point at which we're full, right? Um, and so some people have really kind of limited, um, you know, kind of ability to store peripheral fat. Some people have greater ability to store peripheral fat. That ability to store peripheral fat, interestingly, is kind of a combination of genetics, epigenetics, early childhood. And it, by about age 18, you kind of have the number of healthy fat cells that you're going to get. So from that point on, all you can do with storing fat is stuff more fat into those healthy fat cells. At a certain point, the fat cells get full, they start to leak fat, this uh, fat, they, they, they essentially, you know, be, become uh, unhealthy and, and you get some inflammation and, and some other things. When you do get that, what happens is the fat starts to spill over and, you know, the term is ectopic fat. You get fat in places it doesn't belong. And so on the outside, you can see that as belly fat. Or, and that's why the waist circumference is so important because the waist circumference actually gives us a pretty good idea that, hey, you know what? You're, you probably crossed your personal fat threshold. You're getting fat in places it shouldn't be. Um, but the fat within kind of, it's, 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 it's kind of the fat within the insulin sensitive tissues like muscle and liver and pancreas um, that, that really makes, makes an issue here. And so you kind of get this cascading problem. And so, you know, as you get fat in the muscle, the muscle it becomes insulin resistant. It can't absorb the car carbs you're eating. So it's going to make the problem worse, right? Because when we're eating carbohydrates that breaks down into glucose, that glucose 80 to 90% is going to end up in the muscle if the muscle is able to absorb it. Um, but if you get fat in the muscle and the muscle becomes insulin resistant, it doesn't absorb it as well. Um, and, uh, and so you start getting fat and more glucose hitting the liver. Uh, and so then the liver starts turning that all into fat and it tries to export it. And so, you know, if there's any patients listening, if your triglycerides are above one millimole per liter, your liver's actively exporting fat right now, right? Like it's, it's trying to, it's trying to shed that fat. Um, unfortunately the liver can't quite do that. And, and so you start to get fat in the liver and, um, and then you also start to get fat in the pancreas, which can affect the beta cell, but we'll talk about that in a bit. So this insulin resistance ends up being kind of this, you know, your body's trying to deal with all this extra energy. It at first kind of can store it safely. Then it starts storing in places that's not safe. Um, and then you get this resistance because of the fat in these cells. And so the biggest kind of place to think about this is the liver, right? And, and it's kind of most dramatic because, you know, the liver is kind of our metabolic control center. When we're, you know, when we eat, we get our, our blood sugar comes from the food that we've eaten. But as soon as we've absorbed that food, our liver's, you know, probably most important job is to maintain blood sugars, like to put out a little bit of glucose. The liver does that and it, it's controlled by the pancreas by two, two hormones. One's glucagon, which kind of stimulates, you know, the, the liver to produce a little bit more. And the other is insulin, which kind of slows down the process. And so when you get fat in the hepatocytes, fat in the liver cells, it affects the, the, the insulin receptor. And so what happens is uh, the insulin receptor does not work as well and blood sugars will go up a little bit. The break, you know, essentially the break on the liver's glucose production doesn't work as well. Blood sugars go up a little bit and then the pancreas has to respond by increasing the amount of insulin. And so the pancreas does that and it puts, and so for a while things are okay, right? Like you still maintain a normal blood sugar, but what's happening is your insulin levels are starting to climb. And this just makes things worse because insulin's an energy storage hormone, right? So, you know, insulin, yes, it stores glucose. Remember, glucose is energy, um, but insulin also helps you store fat. It helps you store proteins as well. It also inhibits fat burning, right? So, um, you know, one, one of the, uh, you know, uh, one of the fam famous diabetes researchers actually said, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, this insulin resistance problem, as you start getting these really high levels of insulin, it's like somebody put a turnstile on your fat. Like you can store energy, but you can't actually access and burn it because the insulin levels are inhibiting, you know, inhibiting your ability to burn fat. And it kind of makes sense, right? Because you think about it, like normally insulin is a signal that we've just eaten and there's energy circulating in our blood from the meal that we just ate. 
So that's the signal. And so it, it, it has all these other effects. The problem with insulin resistance is you end up getting kind of these higher and higher levels of insulin, which cause this kind of fat turnstile, which then just makes things worse. Um, and when you see people with severe insulin resistance um, and you explain this process to them, um, they'll often actually, like in, in my experience, I've had people cry and, and it's the first time they've actually understood their body because they, some people have a super pancreas that can compensate forever and produce like insulin levels that are 300% normal. Um, those people gain a lot of weight. So they tend to kind of be heavier. Um, they have no trouble gaining weight. They can't lose it. Like they try everything. They cannot lose the weight. Um, and they feel like they're just stuck and, and they are kind of stuck in this vicious cycle. And so, um, so, you know, that, that becomes, you know, really, you know, just severe insulin resistance is, is really, a, you know, an extreme problem. When you look at the complications of insulin resistance, you know, kind of even before you get to, to, to diabetes, um, you, you actually see, you know, so increased rates of cancer, increased rates of heart disease, increased rates of stroke. In fact, most of the risk for kind of macrovascular complications, so the complications of, you know, atherosclerosis, most of those risks actually come from the insulin resistance side of the equation. Um, and so you, you actually get a lot of the same risks um, as type 2 diabetes, yet we don't diagnose this very often, right? Like, so yes, if you get full-blown metabolic syndrome and, and somebody actually takes the time to kind of look at it, at it you might get diagnosed with metabolic syndrome. Um, but until recently, we didn't do a lot with people with metabolic syndrome other than tell them to you know, <laughs> lose weight and exercise more, right? Um, so, so insulin resistance is a, is a huge problem. Um, when we look at kind of what happens to tip you into diabetes, uh, essentially, a, you know, your pancreas is really cranking out a lot of insulin and it's working very hard. And there's a bunch of things that that causes stress. So First of all, just the fat that's circulating causes lipotoxicity. You get some fat within the pancreas that causes the, the, the beta cells not to work as well. Second, high blood sugars actually create some glucotoxicity in, in the pancreas. Third, you get inflammation. So just insulin resistance gener generates an inflammatory response. So your immune system is, is kind of cranking and, and that inflammation affects the beta cell. Third, uh, fourth now, I guess, uh, you, you, you get, you know... Uh, you know, basically stress from the amount of insulin you're creating. So, you know, basically, yeah, uh, endoplasmic reticulum stress, right? So you're producing so many proteins that, that, that it just starts to, you get, mil, you know, misformed proteins. Um, and then you also get something called amylin deposit, right? So amylin is something that, that your, your pancreas creates, and it actually will normally kind of send it out. And it has a bunch of kind of positive effects from a metabolic health perspective, but that amylin will kind of crystallize and, 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 and basically clog up your pancreas as well. So you get all these different th things that are affecting the pancreas. Um, and so the pancreas starts to lose ground. Um, and so you see, and I, we got these kind of diagrams that I use in our program, you know, insulin levels rising as the liver fills with fat, then you start to get the pancreas affected and you get this plateau. And at that plateau is when you get prediabetes, right? That's the first inkling that your blood sugars go up because you know, essentially you can't make any more insulin to deal with this increased insulin resistance. The balance is starting to tip. Your blood sugars are starting to go up. So there's nothing pre about prediabetes, right? Like it, it's, it's actually the signal that your pancreas no longer can keep up. It's losing the race and, and, you know, and that's prediabetes. Um, when you look at the beta cells, about 50% of them at that point are really dysfunctional and, and the other 50% are working like crazy. If it continues, you start to see a little bit of decline of, 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 uh, of you know, insulin production. The beta cells just you know, start to, to deteriorate. Um, and by the time you get to di you know, full you know, diagnosis of diabetes, you know, A1C above 6.5%, um, about 80% of your beta cells are, are affected. And so you, you're, you're now kind of into, into full-blown diabetes. And so understanding this and understanding kind of the, the sequence of events that happens um, is incredibly important. Um, there's a seminal uh, Banting lecture uh, from DeFranzo in like I think 2008 or 2009, the ominous octet. And, and he walks through kind of this whole body response uh, to, to, to essentially energy overload. And, and it's, it's hugely interesting for, for people to, to kind of go through and understand. Um, 
And, and, you know, I've, I've kind of painted it like it's very sequential, but obviously it's the body. So it's all these things are kind of happening at once, but really what, what's happening. If you, if you come all the way back to it for most people, it's, it's this initial energy overload that's, that that's occurring. That's an incredible explanation. Thank you for that. Because often I think that people think that type two diabetes is just, well, there's just too much sugar right? And my body's not responding properly to sugar, but it's really a lot more complex. And it sounds like there's a lot of different phases even to this. Do you think that we, we should be more aggressive when it comes to giving people the tools that they need or, or even just detecting this with, with lab work? Um, I know you said that there's no, no such thing as, as pre-diabetes, right? Um, do you think that catching this earlier would be, would be beneficial? Def definitely. The earlier you the earlier you address this, the easier it is to reverse, right? And so, um, you know, hepatic insulin resistance is fully reversible. And, and so it, it really involves getting rid of the fat from the liver. And, um, and, and you know, the, the, um, the work that we're doing really stands on the shoulders of, of people like Roy Taylor and Mike Lean, who, who did the work on the direct trial and, and kind of their, their work. It's just brilliant, right? Um, and Taylor has got this body of work that goes, you know, and it actually started from the insight that, you know, and I always kind of laugh at this, you know, in 1992, so basically a year after I finished my training, a paper came out and it was a meta-analysis looking at ruin wide bariatric surgery and the remission rates, uh, 10 year remission rates for type two diabetes of over 70% in, in patients that had that surgery. So we've known since then that type two diabetes can actually be reversed and you could get lasting remissions from that. We went down a path for a long time where we thought there was something special about the bariatric surgery. You know, maybe it was an incretin effect or something like that. Um, but Taylor really kind of like took that insight and, and wrestled with it. And um, so he's done all these MRI studies of liver and pancreas and showing kind of that the, as the fat accumulates in the liver, the insulin resistance goes up and as fat accumulates in the pancreas, the pancreas starts to lose ground. And his twin cycle theory is really, really kind of, you know, it's, 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 it's brilliant. It's, it's probably an oversimplification, um, which is okay because you know, it gets to probably 80% of things right. Um, but it, it, from a clinical framework, it's super helpful as well because um, literally, as I describe kind of what we're describing there, um, patients that hear that start to understand, oh, well, wait a second, I control some of this, right? Like, you know, I actually control what I eat. I control my activity. Um, I control different aspects of this. And, and it comes back to that lifestyle medicine insight, which is, you know, boy, if you get these behaviors right, if the behaviors align with your physiology, usually good things happen. And so, you know, the earlier you tackle this, the better. Um, you know, right now, what we see is there's actually a fair number of people with type 2 diabetes that aren't diagnosed, uh, probably. And, and so, you know, that's 10 or 11% of the population has type 2 diabetes. We think there's another 20% that are pre-diabetic and probably six out of seven don't know that they're pre-diabetic. Um, so that, 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 you know, you have that. And then if you, if you went back further still, there's probably, a, you know, another 30% of the population that's insulin resistant to some extent. So now you're talking actually 60% of the population. And so this is the challenge, you know, if you, if you have a purely clinical model, can you have a purely clinical model for 60% of the population? Or at some point, does it have to kind of go back to a more of a public health approach, right? Um, so, in, 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 you know, in our program, we, we take on people with, with type 2 diabetes and we take on people with prediabetes. We will, if, 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 if a doctor refers somebody who's insulin resistant but does not have prediabetes or, or diabetes, we'll, we'll, we'll accept them. The big thing that we just want to make sure is that, that they know that they actually don't have diabetes and they're in our program purely on the insulin resistance side. Yeah. Well, that's nice that that's, it's accessible that way. Um, I also wanted to touch on, you know, we know that uh, energy overload, right, and the consumption of calories, uh, this, and all, as well as lifestyle measures, right, so your the, the amount of activity can impact insulin resistance. But I know that sleep, you, you speak a lot in your program, I think, about sleep, as well as stress, and how this can impact someone who, who may already be insulin resistant. Can you explain that a little bit to us, how the body reacts to, to uh, maybe a lack of sleep, bad sleep habits, or just a chronic stress? Yeah. So, um, 
So sleep and stress, we, we call them the wild cards in, in our program. So our four plus two, you know, maybe I'll just back up for a second. Our, our four plus two strategy, you know, the, the first is, is eat in such a way to lower your insulin requirements. And so, um, you know, it's, it's really addressing, you know, kind of that whole nutritional aspect of this. Um, second part of it is using your muscles and, and, and restoring your muscles role. Your, your muscles are this incredible buffer for energy overload. And, and so if you're actually active, you can, you can do a whole lot to kind of offset um, some of, some of these factors. The third kind of is, is kind of being kind to your liver and focusing on things that are particularly harmful to the liver, or add fat to the liver. So alcohol, fructose, and kind of gut health issues are, are kind of the three big things there. And then the fourth part is, is restoring your ability to burn fat. And so it's leveraging the circadian rhythm where we naturally burn fat at nighttime uh, and, you know, aerobic exercise where kind of at aerobic levels, you know, so when our muscles have enough oxygen, the preferred fuel is fat. So if you get the body to be a little bit better at fat burning, um, then you, you, you start to have that ability to lose weight. So those are kind of the core parts of the four plus two, but the plus two are sleep and stress, as you said, and they're, they're with the wild cards. And, and I probably shouldn't even say wild cards because, you know, week eight of our, our, our 12 week group program is is all about stress and you know i'll, I'll routinely you know, you know how many people feel like stress you know plays a role in their type 2 diabetes and everybody's hand goes up right like it just it's it's ubiquitous and and the problem with stress is is that uh, you know your stress response is is a response that's that's you know there you know fight flight or freeze right it's it's basically the the you know it's it you know, it, it's a preserved response to what were predominantly physical stressors. And so you release cortisol and adrenaline and cortisol and adrenaline send signals to mobilize more energy, right? And so cortisol will, will <laughs> send a signal to your healthy fat to release more fat. It'll send a signal to your liver to produce more glucose. Um, so that's great if you're running from a bear, you know, like you've got this physical thing that you've got. It's not so great if it's you're responding to an email or work stress or family stress where it's also, you know, it's, it's a psychological thing. And so um, what ends up happening is if you don't use the energy that's been mobilized, um, that energy gets preferentially stored in your in your visceral fat. And so you, you can see this, you know, and I'm sure you've seen this with people that are on prednisone, right? So they're taking, you know, exogenous, uh, you know, cortisol and, and essentially what happens is they, they actually lose their healthy peripheral fat and they get central fat. So you start to get, get belly fat and often kind of being on, on, you know, on prednisone or other cortisol can, can actually push people into, into type two diabetes. So cortisol is a big deal, right? Um, Cortisol also drives appetite and it drives appetite in, in, in a way that, that isn't very helpful because it, it's kind of the comfort foods you seek. And so foods that are high in fat and high in carbohydrates are going to be comfort foods there. And you go back on the nutrition side and it's like, well, what's one of the biggest problems that we see, you know, you know, what's changed since 1970 when the prevalence of type two diabetes was less than 2% Our food, right? Um, more than 50% of the calories Canadians eat are ultra processed. And so, uh, when you get stressed, you know, you're not, you're not reaching for the broccoli and hummus, right? Like, you, you know, like the pizza sounds really good, right? You just get, so, so that becomes a problem. Sleep is an issue as well, just from the standpoint of if you don't sleep, you get a stress response. And especially, and if you have, you know, a, a, a sleep disorder, like sleep apnea, you, you, you really might overactivate your stress, stress response. Um, and so sleep is, is, is quite similar that way. And so these, these are things that we kind of have to look at and say, okay, you know, is, how, how much is this a component for, for an individual? Um, and one of the big things that we, we do in our program is just, just as we assess kind of and, and go through your lab work to figure out, okay, you know, what's your degree of insulin resistance? How is your pancreas working? Kind of what's happening at your liver? Are there any other kind of things we need to know kind of from your biochemistry? We also do the same kind of thing, except we, we ask you a whole series of questions around you know, nutrition and exercise and sleep and stress, and then a whole set of symptom categories that really helps us understand, okay, you know, for, for you, you know, it may be that you're actually exercising really well, but, but the stress is, is, is a big factor uh, and it's compounding things. So um, yeah, so sleep and stress, you know, it's, it's um, 
I, I think, you know, again, understanding the physiology starts to make you really realize, okay, this is, this is not just kind of, you know, a, 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 a nicety that we're talking about. This is really, this is really central to, to a lot of people's experience with, with insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I like that you give that holistic approach, yeah. right? Because it's really necessary. I wanted to touch a little bit on, on nutrition because you, you just touched on that there. Uh, what are some of the biggest, I guess, not mistakes that people make, but maybe the biggest myths surrounding nutrition. I think you do talk a lot about the importance of protein and how that plays into, into all of this. Um, could you speak a little bit to that? Yeah. So, so with nutrition, the first thing, the first and single most important thing is whole foods. Um, and, and we need to really kind of step back and look at like what happens. So you know, you and I will likely eat somewhere around like, you know, somewhere between 1.2 and 1.5 million calories this year. And you think about that and you think about the whole variety of foods that we eat. And what we're relying on is, is signals from our intestine to our brain to tell us to stop eating. Right. And, uh, and so when you kind of paint, you know, look at it from that, it's like, a, it's unbelievable. It works. Right. And for most of human history, it worked just fine. Right. Um, and so the food sends signals. And there's at least 10 different hormones plus stomach stretch receptors. There's all sorts of signals coming to the brain. The brain basically processes that and kind of tries to figure out, you know, enough energy on board, enough protein on board. Um, and, and this, of course, happens in a subconscious part of your brain, your hypothalamus. So um, and so, you know, one of those signals, interestingly, and I'm sure we'll get to it, is GLP-1, right? And, and, and so the, you know, ozempic or semaglutide mimics that hormone. Well, that's a natural hormone that your body's producing in response to food. It's, it's, it's one of 10, 10 or 11 different signals. Um, and so you need to, again, you know, align your behavior with your physiology. You need to align what you're eating with foods that your body can interpret correctly. And so the biggest issue with ultra processed food is, is simply that, you know, and it, it breaks down really quickly, right? It doesn't come in the original food matrix. You know, the, 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 you know, one of the simplest ways to explain ultra processed food is, is look, it's no longer within the cells that, that, that it grew. Right. So, you know, uh, plants, there's <laughs> their cells, animals, their cells, right. So you're eating plants and animals they're, they're you're eating actually the cellular structure. There's a matrix around this food. You, the ultra processed food, they've extracted nutrients and they've recombined them. Um, and so they get absorbed super quickly and they don't send a satiation signal. So they're, they're like that, you know, they're like a stealth calorie, right? So, you know, you, you eat a thousand calories and your brain, your hypothalamus that, you know, I, I like to think of the you know, little accountant up there kind of counting, you know, that's where the counting calories really takes place um, is, is processing. I think we ate 400, right? Let's keep eating. Um, it, you know, why do you go to McDonald's and eat 2000 calories at lunch and you're hungry two hours later? Like, how does that happen? Well, it happens because you absorb it so quickly. And that's the nature of these ultra processed foods. So, so first and foremost, helping people understand that the ultra processed foods, which are ubiquitous. And as you try to tackle it, you realize how hard it is to tackle, but that's a big thing. And so getting people to shift to whole foods, um, is, is really kind of one of the, the, the biggest first steps. Then we look at it from the standpoint of, well, you know, you've got this problem in the sense that you've got this balance between the amount of insulin your pancreas can produce and the amount of resistance that that insulin faces. What if we, you know, if we're eating foods that break down really quickly into glucose, that's going to require a lot of insulin. Our balance is already out of line. And so if we're eating a lot of fast carbohydrates and we're diabetic, we're just simply not going to be able to maintain blood sugar control. And so, so that, then it's like, okay, you know, do we throw out all the carbs? Do we, you know, go very low carb? Um, and some people do that and, and, and that can, that can work and it can help. Um, but it's like throwing the baby out with the bathwater, right? Like, you know, um, your veg, the carbs you get into your vegetables aren't the issue, right? And so we break it down into there are green light carbs that are kind of healthy. You can eat as much as you want because they get absorbed super slowly, they include most of the vegetables, but they also include, you know, you know, beans, legumes, pulses, you know, lentils, chickpeas, kind of that whole category of high carb foods, but they're super slow carbs, right? Then there's the red light carbs that, you know, the sugar, kind of the <laughs> sugar starch uh, uh, flour, kind of th those things that clearly are just not going to be helpful for you. And then the hard part for people is there's a bunch of stuff in the middle, right? So there's whole grains and, 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 you know, foods that, um, frankly, are really good for you, 
but they have a lot of carb and they get absorbed reasonably quickly. So they might tip you out of balance. Um, and so, for, you know, for people, we, we, we like, we love them to use a, a continuous glucose monitor to, to figure out their yellow light carbs. So, so first principle, whole foods, second principle, low, low glycemic load. We're looking for those kind of green light carbs. And then we're trying to watch the yellow light carbs while getting rid of the red light carbs. Fiber is our friend here, right? And so fiber, you know, one of the issues of going low carb is you throw out fiber and you look at fiber and it's like, well, uh, fiber, first of all, it slows down absorption, right? So right away, it just slows down the absorption of, of your of glucose and it slows down absorption of fat too. Um, in fact, you you often kind of uh, end up, you know, and there, there's there's a study I just posted on our blog, you know, you you end up, you know, letting go of more energy through, through your poop, right? You, you just don't absorb as much energy if you have a high fiber diet. Um, but there's way more to fiber than that. Fiber is the food for our healthy bacteria. And, and so fiber um, will help us, first of all, it help us grow more of our healthy bacteria. Our healthy bacteria then turns fiber into something called short chain fatty acids. Um, and short chain fatty acids, what do they do? They help you stimulate more GLP-1. They help with PYY. Um, they actually help with kind of almost every different uh, satiation and uh, you know, appetite hormone. They kind of set it all in the positive direction. They also help you burn fat more easily, right? And so, um, so, so making sure people get enough fiber is a huge, huge issue for us. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of help them understand that and help them kind of progress their fiber intake. And then, and, and then kind of the last kind of principles around protein and, and recognizing that your brain, when you look at satiation, it clearly understands kind of caloric content of food coming in, but independent of that, it manages protein. And so the mistake isn't that you don't get enough protein kind of overall, the mistake is that you don't get enough protein with every meal. And so, and especially if you're eating kind of uh, ultra processed foods, sometimes you, you, you may end up with, you know, so if, if you're somebody that gets up and, in, 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 you know, on your way to work has a double, double and a, you know, and a donut or a muffin or something like that, you've gotten a lot of energy, but not a lot of protein. And you'll be hungry afterwards because, because your, 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 your brain's saying, Hey, wait a second, we, we don't have any protein on board yet. Um, and, and the, the, the thing that we make a huge emphasis on, and we'll probably touch on this when we talk about kind of semaglutide is, you know, our bodies store fat and our bodies store carbs, but we don't store protein. So every day you got to get enough protein or else you'll use amino acids from your muscle. You'll break down your muscle in order to kind of meet your protein requirements. So we, we want to be really careful with that. So, so again, the, you know, it's kind of summarizing the nutritional approach is very principle-based. Um, and so we don't put people on a diet. We don't tell them, you know, do this or, you know, <laughs> you know, do this diet or do that diet. People are just too different, right? And, and so we, we give them the set of principles and then we help them figure out, you know, so that kind of teaches them kind of what to do, but then we help them figure out, well, how to do that within the context of their culture, what they like. Um, most people have some pretty good habits, right? And so it's like, okay, great. Let's build around those. And let's kind of look at the things that aren't working so well and make some fine tuning adjustments. Um, and, and that principle-based approach, I think really, really works well. And, and it's something that's, it's much more sustainable because you're not trying to follow some rigid guideline, you know, that, that is usually what most diets are. Yeah. And the sustainability that you speak to there is so important, right? Because we're looking at, you know, this, these practices will help you over the period of your lifetime is this is not just a band-aid approach, right? This is a, this is a lifestyle change, right? And so you need to offer something and help people build something that's sustainable for them. Keeping in mind, like you said, their, their cultural practices, what do they actually like, right? What are they actually going to be able to, to stick to, right? And, and it, it's, it is like, it's so important for people to realize this, right? And, and because you, it's, it's not about like, you know, it's, it's not about losing the weight to reverse the diabetes and you're done. Because if you go back to what you're doing before, it's going to come back and it's going to come back really quickly. It's, we, we use the metaphor of a path, right? It's like finding a path that's heading the right direction. So it's heading, you know, towards metabolic health versus towards type two diabetes. And so in our 12 week program, our goal is to help people find the path. It's not to achieve remission in 12 weeks. Um, our goal is to find people, help people make the set of changes that they can do every day, that if they keep doing them, they'll keep heading towards better and better metabolic health. And, um, and kind of, it's hard for, 
it's hard for people. It's a it's a real psycho yeah psychological change to 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 do that because um, we're so governed by well, what's my number? And if my number is good, all's good, right? And and so you know, constantly coaching people that you know don't don't measure the value of what you're doing purely by the numbers you're getting, right? If you're doing kind of these, if you if you're building these good habits, um, it's going to have positive effects in multiple different ways. The numbers eventually will follow. But it's just like, you know, you're, you're out hiking in the woods and you, you, you know, there's a, there's a sign on the trail. Sometimes it's disappointing. You know, you've been hiking for three hours and you get hit a sign and says, you, you've got another, you know, three hours to go. Right. And, you know, that's disappointing. Right. It's like, oh, I'm done. I just want to, yeah. You know. um, but we kind of make the you know, point that you're not really like, you're going to do this forever. Right. And so at a certain point, the psychology switches and, and time is actually your friend because it's like you know, every day that I do this I'm healthier and 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 now I can see kind of what my own physiology is going to be able to do and and so that's kind of the the big thing that we emphasize and and so it's you know we 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 we, we don't tell people to count calories it make you know it makes no sense if you understand the physiology to, to actually count calories um we we kind of give them the set of principles and we tell them look this is not about being perfect because you know if you're perfect it's probably pretty rigid and that's going to break you know when you're all in there's only one one option which is out right so we we we, we use kind of this this mantra you know better not perfect and uh, it's super forgiving and it and it kind of allows you to to you know if you're in a situation where you, there are no good choices well you make the best choice you can right and so you start to kind of navigate your way through life like that it's actually a lot easier because it, it just becomes, I don't have to be perfect, but you know, what's the best choice available to me now? Uh, what can I do that would be better than, than what I was doing last week? And you keep working at that. Yeah. Way. And then you see the benefits from those choices, right? Over, over a period of a lifetime. Yeah. And so I wanted to touch, we've, we've talked a little bit, a bit about nutrition and about lifestyle. Uh, I cannot speak with you today without <laughs> asking you about what you think about you know, Ozempic, Wagovi, how you approach this in your practice. I know that sometimes patients come to into your program and they are on these medications, right? Um, it was fascinating to me. I recently was doing some reading and I found out the yeah, fiber can help with short chain fatty acid production. This can influence GLP-1 and no one is talking about this, right? Um, but there are some things that I think uh, have not been communicated very well about these uh, GLP-1 agonists. Um, what are some of the things that you think that, that we might be, uh, maybe under communicating or, or just not, just not counseling patients properly about when it comes to, uh, these medications? Yes. So for, first of all, I think we, we really do just need to put them into context, right? Like, um, so they are amazing medications and I love having them in the toolkit. And, uh, so I, I want to say that kind of first and foremost, right? Like, um, we should be, we should be thrilled that we have these these medications available to us. Does everybody need to be on a GLP-1? No, it doesn't. It makes no sense, right? Um, and and you you I I, I did a um, I, I did a, a webinar on this, and 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 maybe you can put in kind of your show notes just a link to this. And if you look at what GLP ones do, and you look at what ultra processed foods do, they're like mirror images of each other. And so if you look at you know, if you go back to the 1960s, uh, our population didn't have a weight issue, right? So obesity is really a phenomenon that, that's occurred since the 1960s. Um, and it's largely occurred because of the change in our food system. And when you look at exactly what our food system changes look like, it's the mirror, it's physiologically the mirror, it's the opposite of what GLPs are trying to correct. So to me, it, it kind of like, you kind of go, hang on a second. You know, why would you take a drug that fixes the lifestyle problem. Why wouldn't you just go fix the lifestyle problem, right? And so, it, you know, it's 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 you know they they are the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, right? Um, and so so trying to correct that first, I think, is is really important. Um, so so I think that you know, um, and what we find is is that you know people that uh, may you know may you know, want a GLP-1 kind of often don't need a GLP-1 after they've made some of these changes. The other big point that we kind of make is, is like, well, you know, if you take a GLP-1, but you don't actually correct kind of the, the, the underlying issue, 
uh, which is that nutrition, then when you stop the GLP-1, the evidence clearly shows that you're going to regain everything that you've lost. Um, but here's the, the, the thing that kind of worries me about the drugs, right, is um, they're, they're satiation drugs. So GLP-1 is a satiation hormone. Uh, it, it does a bunch of other things. And, and there are actually some, some, you know, benefits we probably won't get into just kind of around kind of for, for diabetes that sometimes makes them really effective, even when we're not looking for weight loss. I, I, I don't want to dismiss that, but for the most part, kind of in the zeitgeist of our culture right now, we're looking at them from the standpoint of weight loss. Um, so if you're taking a drug that, that increases your satiation effect, you're just going to eat less and you're going to have less desire for foods. And, um, and people are, you know, kind of realizing that, that, you know, some of the compulsive behavior is really probably just driven by kind of their, their hormonal signals around appetite. Um, and so but the problem is you're going to eat less calories, but you're also probably going to eat less protein. And so you see lean muscle loss on this. You see lean mass loss. And um, there's kind of two of the trials that they did, DEXAs on people, kind of whole body DEXA to get body composition changes, showed a, a pretty alarming kind of reduction of about 40% of the weight loss was from lean mass. Um, not all of that's muscle, but some of it is muscle. And, uh, and that's concerning. And so, again, it's the kind of thing that if you're going to go on a GLP-1, it's like, you know, you, you really want to prioritize, understand kind of what your protein requirements are, prioritize getting that protein. You know, you, you need to exercise as well to actually use the protein, but, that's another, but you really want to have this strategy in place. And so what we find kind of in, in the way we work in our program is, is essentially we teach people the strategy in a 12-week kind of intensive program. At the end of that, we we do an, you know, we, 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 we see where people are. So we do some more lab work and we see kind of what changes have been made. We also see kind of how far their weight has come down. Are they getting close to where we think their personal fat threshold is? Um, are they on a path to do this sustainably by themselves or do they sometimes need help, right? And so you go back to kind of those severely insulin resistance people. Some of those people have a heck of a hard time getting the, the ball rolling, right? And, uh, and so sometimes the GLP ones can be hugely beneficial because you've got a tool in the toolkit that can help somebody. Um, but we really should be thinking about, you know, lifestyle medicine, lifestyle first, and then, and then go into the toolkit for these things. Um, and, 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 and I think that that will be helpful for people. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for explaining that. I think it's so important that we, that we do address protein, right? And strength training and that kind of thing uh, with any of these, with any of these approaches. So what are you seeing in your program? So Lifestyle RX has been running now for a few years. What kind of results are you seeing uh, in your patients? Yeah. So, so this is, this is kind of fun, right? Like um, we've got, we've, we've got a, a data set that's, that's growing and, and we're seeing some pretty amazing results. So um, first thing that we actually see is that 93% of our patients insulin resistance is the primary problem. So about well, 6.8% of our patients come in and, and it's, it's actually pancreatic deficiency, right? And so those patients, um, it's either autoimmune process or it's a genetic process that just leaves them with very limited capacity to produce insulin. Um, so for them, you know, remission really isn't, isn't right, the right goal. It's, it's, it's better control that, that you're going to get. For 93% of our population, insulin resistance is, is the primary issue. Um, and when we look at it, what we're seeing in, in our, you know, our data now, kind of our kind of average difference between a first and last A1C is about 141 days. So we're just past kind of one A1C cycle. Um, as, as, there, as we get a larger data set, we're going to see kind of the, the, the kind of more follow up on that. The average person with insulin resistance in our program comes in with an A1C of 7.8. And uh, after that kind of hundred, that kind of the next A1C is 6.8 on average. Um, and so you see that kind of full percentage point reduction. If they have perfectly normal pancreatic function, their average kind of coming in is about 7.7% and they drop to about 6.4%. So actually getting within that remission area. Now, you know, some of them, we, there's med medication adjustments, whether they've been deprescribed, you know, is, is kind of another, another piece. If they have normal pancreatic function and their duration of diabetes is less than six years, we're seeing people come in kind of in that category with an average of about 7.2%, uh, and they actually get their A1C down to 6.3%, right into that pre-diabetic range, right? 
Um, and so you, you kind of look at this and again, it's kind of, this is, this, this is the kind of point I'm trying to make to everybody. It's like, um, you know, what we're doing is part of every single clinical practice guideline in the world for type two diabetes. First step is lifestyle. The challenge is, you know, really kind of until now, it was just really hard to do this at scale because we didn't really have virtu like virtual wasn't an option. If you do it at scale, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing that our patients, you know, if they come in poorly controlled, we can get them to optimal control. If they come in kind of suboptimally controlled, we can actually get them into the pre-diabetic range. If they come in optimally controlled, we can get them lower into that pre-diabetic range. Um, so we're seeing kind of that improvement across the, the, the board with people. And so, you know, remission is, I think remission is a great goal for people. And I think patients, um, it's, it's the hope. Right. You know, kind of you, you alluded at the beginning, you know, your, 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 your patient who came with the metformin prescription looked like he had, he had received a death sentence. The conventional approach to type 2 diabetes is we tell patients it's chronic, it's progressive. There's really nothing you can do. We'll start you on one med, but by you know, nine years, you'll, you know, you know, 90% will be on two meds. By 11 to 13 years, you know, many of you will be on insulin. Half of you will be on insulin. Like that was kind of the traditional thing. And oh, by the way, if you don't maintain good blood sugar control, you, you, you might go blind, you might get your, you know, you might need an amputation, might have a heart attack, you might have a stroke, you're at higher risk for cancer. Oh, and did we tell you that you, there's a higher risk for depression? You know, like it's, 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 and, 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 you know, if you look at stress response, fight, flight, or freeze, people freeze with that. Like you, you like, like there's nothing I can do. That's what's going to happen. I'm going to go into denial. I'm going to ignore it. And and really what we want to try to get across to people is, is well, wait a second, the underlying process of insulin resistance is absolutely reversible, right? And so people can sometimes get hung up on, you know, the word reverse, but we just mean that you're able to take it in a different direction. Um, and so that part is reversible. Everybody can get better by improving their lifestyle. And so we should be giving a lifestyle prescription to every single person with type 2 diabetes and every single person with prediabetes. And we should be helping them kind of find this. Um, you know, what you're going to see is, is, you know, our, our results are as good as any of the medications. So they're additive, right? So it's another, again, another thing in the toolkit, but let's put it where it is in the guidelines. Let's put it first, and then we can go to other things in the toolkit. And there's always, you know, the thing that I, you know, I love about medicine is, is that, you know, we, we have these tools where sometimes it's like somebody comes in and they're, you know, they get really good control, but they're at really high risk for, for kidney disease. And some of these medications we're not even using for their blood sugar control anymore. We'll use them for their kidney perspective, but now they at least understand that, right? And so, so that, that, that's, you know, kind of the, the, the real thing that, that I see is just, you know, if we start this first, it's a great compliment and, you know, for, for the care that we're trying to deliver. This must be incredibly rewarding for you to see. How's your experience been? You know, it, it's, it really is. And, and I, I got it you know, on LinkedIn. I, I wrote a post kind of, you know, I'm, I'm 59 and I actually feel like I've never had kind of, kind of my professional kind of life working as well as, as it is. And, you know, so obviously I'm, I'm somebody who likes to innovate and I, I, I've created companies and done that. And that's kind of, I, I like to start things that, you know, um, I also like software because I, I think there's a lot that we can do that software can help us. Um, but, you know, when I started the software company for EMRs, my, my goal was, could we turn this information into better health outcomes? And that was our tagline at, at Wolf. And then Telus actually took that tagline as well. The depressing part with EMR was it never really got there, right? Like it, it just, you know, um, the structures were that pe people couldn't, couldn't, you couldn't really use the information to, to really some, I mean, some people did, but, but it wasn't like what, what I'd hoped in this practice, we're able to do that. And, and, and so we're able to see kind of from our data, what's working, we're able to tweak and understand what's maybe not working, um, and continue to refine that. And so, it actually kind of, uh, I think we're, we are able to help people kind of understand kind of their information and, and then they turn it into better outcomes. So it's, 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 you know, it's really gratifying to see this. Um, the other, the other thing that's interesting is, is, you know, when you prescribe a medication and the patient gets the, the result that you expect from the medication, you know, professionally at some level, you feel good, you know, kind of check that, that box. Um, 
but it's a very different feeling than you, you coach somebody. And, and like I joke, we're kind of like Sherpas. Like we don't climb the mountain for these people. They do it themselves, right? Like, and um, the personal transformations that people get from this are like, they spill over, you know, it's just like a different person kind of, you know, comes out at the other end of this. And it's incredibly gratifying and inspiring to see people make those changes. Um, you know, I was, uh, I was out running in White Rock at where, I, where I live. Um, and this was in the summer and I get, get end of the summer and, and somebody like in a pickup kind of pulled up beside me and jumped out and, and you know, you're a little bit like, what's going on? And, and she said, I, I want to shake your hand. And I'm like, oh, and, and then she introduced herself. She had done our program uh, kind of starting in about February. And this was about August, about seven months later. She had lost 60 pounds. Um, so she, and, and her, her, her diabetes had, had, had dramatically improved. Um, but she was like, do you remember when you first saw me, I, I needed a walker because my arthritis was so bad. And she's like, I'm walking six miles a day now. And I've joined a gym and like, I'm a different person. And then her husband kind of <laughs> peeked out and said, I've lost 25 pounds too. <laughs> yeah. So like, that kind of thing is just so positive, right? Like, and you just feel like you feel great for that person, right? Like, you know, somebody that was in a walker. And I do remember talking with her about exercise and, you know, we, we try to get people to do something every day and that something can be really small. And I think, I think we landed on like five minutes a day is what she started with. And so in seven months, she was up to six miles a day and she just, yeah, you know, she looked great. Right. Um, and, and so that's the thing you just don't know, like, until you try kind of what's what a person's capable of. Um, and it's, it's really fun to, to see that happen. It's amazing. And it's so inspiring, especially as pharmacists, because for so long, we've, we've wanted to offer patients something more, right? And we just haven't had the, the tools to be able to do this. Um, so I just, I love what you're doing. Can you uh, tell people, so this program, it's a 12 week program, and you're expanding quickly. Um, so uh, can you just tell us a little bit about about that? Yeah, so the, the so we operate a hundred percent within the publicly funded healthcare system, and, and so it, it's available to patients in BC, Alberta, Ontario, uh, at no cost. Um, we plan to add other provinces, uh, you know, hopefully all by the end of twenty twenty four, maybe a little bit into twenty twenty five. Some of the wrinkles there are whether the provinces have virtual care codes that 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 we can access as physicians. Uh, we're going to launch into the U.S. in April, and so we've hired our two. We've hired two medical directors and our lead dietitian. So we've got got the the team is is being built for for that. Um, and we started this really from the basis of kind of the the idea was wow, if you could scale lifestyle medicine, if you could scale this approach, we know it works one on one. If you could scale it, um, and virtual does allow you to scale it, maybe you could bend that diabetes curve that's been going up. And so that's that's really kind of what we what we're trying to do is is bend that curve. Um, one thing I'd like to say, kind of to the pharmacists that are that are listening, is um, you know you have a really key point of contact with patients, right? Because um, we look at you know one of the reasons we get these results and is people come to us ready to change, right? So you know to to register for a program, you go on our website lifestylerx.com. Um, or actually should, should say .ca because it, it, you know, there will be a .com for the U.S. So .ca. Um, so you go on our website, you you just you, you just basically join and it'll get you actually into the first week's worth of content. It'll set up a call with one of our patient success people uh, and they'll get everything set up and, and get you booked with one of our physicians to start. So, you know, the issue kind of, and, but our patients are going to do a lot of work, right? So in 12 weeks that, you know, that taking that one hour, one and one time, it becomes about 30 hours of program time. So above and beyond the changes they're making to their life, they're spending about 30 hours and 12 weeks trying to, 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 to learn this information. So people need to be ready to change, right? The thing with readiness for change is it, it is it, it waxes and wanes at, over a person's time period, right? So that person that came into your office with the metformin, they they probably had a high degree of readiness for change. They 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 just got news that they didn't want to have. They're they're going to be very motivated to change. When they come in for their first refill, maybe not as much anymore. They start to take the metformin. They don't 
have, you know, most people don't have too many side effects from it. They feel okay. Blood sugars got down a little bit better. They made a few adjustments and they kind of, are, now they're living with it. And so they're not actually open to change at that point. They get the second medication, the readiness for change is there. And so we, we kind of call it the lifestyle conversation. And it's just really asking patients, um, like, do, do, you, do you know the role that lifestyle plays in type 2 diabetes? Do you have a good strategy, right? And, you know, do you want help? And, and really kind of, if you ask that question every time you see somebody, um, maybe nine times out of 10, people will be kind of like, ah, oh, whatever, you know, I'm fine. Um, but one time out of 10, you'll get that person at that high readiness for change and they'll, they, the, it'll be a lifeline, right? You've just thrown them a lifeline. And so, you know, for, for us, like we're, we're trying to partner with everybody in the health system that sees patients in this high readiness for change. So with Life Labs, you know, we've, we've partnered with them. And so, you know, you, you can see some of our messaging on, on Life Labs. We've partnered with, you know, Sun Life and Pacific Blue Cross for, for their members, um, you know, we're obviously partnering with physicians and, you know, and try to help physicians in their practice, you know, have an easy way of doing that. And for pharmacists, it's the same thing. It's, it's just having that kind of, you know, you've got a very high leverage point. You don't have the time to kind of you know, do 30 or 40 hours of, uh, of coaching, um, but you don't need to just, you know, point, point them in the direction of, you know, of our, you know, of our program. Um, and then, you know, if you really kind of want to incorporate in this practice, we've got these little prescription pads that you can actually just kind of, it's got a QR code and you can kind of just hand it to people and it makes it really easy for them just to take it and, and run with it. And the nice part with that is, you know, a few quick questions, you, you hand them kind of one of these things. If it ends up in the garbage, they weren't ready for change. Um, but probably one out of 10, maybe one out of five will, will actually kind of be really ready for that change. Uh, and you might've been the spark that really kind of started, started the, 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 that fire of change for them. Yeah, absolutely. And just, just being aware of, of this program and that this is available now, we do have healthcare professionals watching, uh, these interviews, this channel, um, we do have public as well. Right. So, um, and being aware of when you're ready to make, to make those changes or when your patients are ready is, is really, really important. Uh, Dr. Byrne, just wrapping up here. Uh, thank you so much for, for your time today. If you had one message for, you know, like I said, our, our audience is mixed. We have the, some of the public, we have healthcare professionals, but if you had one message to share with people today about metabolic health, what would you, what would you like to share? So I, I think I just kind of break it down. Like type two diabetes is it's a lifestyle disease that affects people who are genetically vulnerable to energy overload. And so it makes sense that lifestyle is where you should start. And, um, you know, so get a lifestyle prescription, you know, come, come join, join our program or find another program that will help you kind of make the lifestyle changes that, that you need to, um, to help. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for the work you're doing and we'll continue to be in touch and we look forward to hearing more, more success stories about uh, the impact that you're really, really having on, on metabolic health. So thank you, Dr. Byrne, for all your time today. Thanks so much, Lindsay.